The following interview was conducted with John M. Healy, Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Economics for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, December 16, 2009, in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Healy, and thank you very much and welcome. Let's it's start my off. pleasure, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about where you were born and your parents and the early years and grade okay. school and high school. Uh, born in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm that time it was called Southern Rhodesia, it was a British colony. Uh, my parents were Methodist missionaries uh, near a town of now called Mutare, M-U-T-A-R-E, then it was Umtali, U-M-T-A-L-I. Uh, problem with, I guess, translation. <laughs> yeah, problem. <laughs> that took place. Uh, they were missionaries there until the Second World War broke out, and that's where I was born. Had they been, and that had been their, their, their original spot mm -hmm. over in Africa? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I think they started in 1936, and I was born in 38. Okay. And then after the U.S. entered the Second World War, missionaries from all over the world were encouraged to come home. And so they came back home and were here then during the war. My dad began some theological training and also some formal work in agriculture. And because he knew when he went back, he's going to be in charge of the farms at the mission stations. Mm -hmm. uh, he grew up on a farm, but really didn't have any formal education, so that allowed him to do that. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up going to school at Tennessee Polytechnic Institute, and we lived in a little town of Baxter, Tennessee, uh, which will become important later in my uh, tour. Yeah, growing, growing up years. Life, okay. <laughs> yeah. Did, had you uh, gone to grade school there, or had you been in grade school in, in Zimbabwe? I was only three years old when we came back oh, okay. here, and so I uh, came back here in, must have been 41 when the U.S. entered the war, and was here then until 46, seven years old when I went back. My sister, Linda, was born here during the war. Uh, then we were there until seven, 1946 to 1950. And my dad died uh, blood clots following an appendix operation, 41 years old. So in December 1950, my mother brought my sister and I back to the States. We ended up then back at Baxter Seminary. This is in Tennessee. In Baxter, in Tennessee. In Baxter Tennessee. <coughs> my mother became a librarian at a Methodist-related high school, uh, the Methodist Church. Uh, under a contract with the local school officials, ran the high school for the for the local community. But they also had a residential facility for kids who, most of them were kids coming from broken families or some other kinds of, of problems back home. They ended up uh, coming to this facility and going to high school there. My dad and my mother was a, became a librarian for a couple of years. I went to the eighth grade, ninth grade, and tenth grade there. Um, what was it like? What was school like? What was it, it, was, like? it was very. It was would a, they have activity? Were there any clubs? And yeah, athletics? they had a number of clubs. And yeah. Very, very similar to the sure. schools today. Not that different. Uh huh. Um, I don't even remember what the enrollment was. But fairly small school. Mm -hmm. um, my mother then transferred from there to um, Martin College, which was a college, a Methodist college, Methodist-related college in Pulaski, Tennessee. Okay. Um, so I had my junior and senior years in high school there, and, and uh, that's where I met my wife, Emily Raleigh, she was at that time. Um, after I graduated, then uh, what was your course of study? Were you planning to go to? Was it a college prep? I mean, were you planning to go on to college? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, wasn't any question about that. Sure. It was just a matter of where and how we were going to pay for it. Sure, right. <laughs> anyway, I ended up at Auburn University then for both my undergraduate degree and general ag program. And uh, at that time in my life, I thought I'd probably end up back at the mission station again because that's all about all I'd known. Turned out we didn't do that, but 
Is your wife with her to, to Auburn as well? No, she continued. Uh, she's a year younger, so she stayed in Tennessee for her first and went first year of college at Martin College there in her hometown. Then she transferred to uh, Montevallo Institute, uh, Montevallo College. Then it's a university today, uh, just south of Birmingham, Alabama, and eventually. I got her to Auburn. <laughs> Good. We're working and, our way towards. We're, work, we're working yeah, towards. There you that. go. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Crimson Tide, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Bear Bryant <laughs> in later years yeah. for, for the researchers. <laughs> well, that, that's 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 Crimson Tide is is Alabama's Indiana University. Yeah. That's, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other school. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, I'd had a couple of economics Ag Econ courses as an undergrad, and I really liked it, so I went to a graduate school and did my undergraduate, my graduate master's degree uh, at Auburn, and then worked for four years with the Extension Service there, and back then what was called rural development uh, in Alabama. Realized that I was going to stay in higher education, and I was going to have to get a PhD. What was your mother and sister doing at that time? Were they still stayed in Tennessee? Uh, no, they they uh, we always stayed together okay. wherever we went. Okay. My mother ended up as a librarian at Auburn University. In fact, that's probably the most significant reason why I ended up at Auburn because she could get a job there okay. and I could live at home. It reduced our cost of education. Oh yeah. Uh, Did your sister go there too? She graduated from Auburn. Mm -hmm. Okay, good and has lived in Alabama all her life. She's still there, right? Yeah. Okay. Not at Auburn, but in she Alabama. lived in, in Birmingham. Okay. Um, when I decided I better go back to school, I applied to three graduate programs, North Carolina State, Michigan State, and Purdue. At that time, my advisors at Auburn had said that was probably th three of the best ag econ programs in the country. I was accepted at all three of them, but only got an uh, assistantship at North Carolina State. So there wasn't much choice about where I was going to go. So I went to North Carolina State, started my PhD program there. Uh, after a year, there was a couple of us there who uh, decided we wanted to transfer, and so uh, he had had some con contacts at Michigan State, and uh, we ended up both transferring to Michigan State, uh, and I finished my PhD program mm -hmm. there. Were you married at that time? Yes. Okay. Got married uh, during my master's program at, at Auburn. Okay. So moved there. We had uh, when I started my PhD program at North Carolina State. Found out the day we were leaving Auburn to go up there to look for a place to stay that Emily was pregnant with our second child. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sounds all right. <laughs> so she spent her time raising two kids while I went to graduate school for three years. At least we've done years. the same. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Did you uh, like it at Michigan State? Or no, uh, both were good programs. Sure. Uh, it was just some things at North Carolina State that. Uh, I thought Michigan State fit, would fit what I was interested in a little better. I had sort of assumed that given my experience at Auburn when I finished my PhD, I'd like to go back there. Um, started interviewing and interviewed a number of different places, but the, the one position that had intrigued me right from the beginning of my interview process was the one here at Purdue. Uh, they didn't have me on their list initially. They interviewed two other people for the job, both Michigan State people. And one of them turned the university down, and the university turned the other one down, so I was third on the list. <laughs> nice. Well, did you just come on your so own, or did you know there was, a, did they invite you for an interview? Yeah, I oh, had, okay. I, they invited me for an interview. Prior to the interview, uh, I had made a follow up contact with them about the position. And Hank Wadsworth, Henry Wadsworth, uh, happened to be on campus at Michigan State for a conference. And the department had asked him to look me up and come by and talk to me. So he did. And, uh, 
a few days later, I got a call from the department head said they'd like for them to come down for an interview. Yeah. That was nice. Yeah. That worked out well. So I had originally been interested in North Carolina State, Michigan State, and Purdue, and ended up part of my time in all three <laughs> places. <laughs> you made the circle, right? That's pretty good. So, all points of the triangle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what was then when you so, came? What was the campus like when you came? What about housing? Using our ads. Um, now, Craner was built at that time. Yeah. Was yeah, already, yeah. Oh, okay, good start. Yeah. Um, campus, of course, was a lot smaller than it is now. Yeah. But, um, Even since I've come, 68. Yeah, right. So the, the facilities, by the way, that, that's the same year I came, 1968. Mm -hmm. Right. It's yeah. a good year for that, Purdue, wasn't it? It is, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> when we're off camera, I'll tell you about yeah. my experience coming down. <laughs> Where'd you live when you first came? Uh, the finances were pretty tight at that time. In fact, we'd had to borrow some money to finish up my, my degree. So I decided to let somebody here pick a place for us to stay. And we ended up the first year here in apartments up on 52, uh, top of the hill, the yellow brick brick. Apartments oh, there. Oh, yeah, right Whispering Winds? Uh, that may be what it's yeah, called it's right now. At the top. Well, I, I know it the was, location. It was called something else back then. Right, okay. And uh, a year later, we decided to uh, build a house and we built uh, in Barbary Heights. It was, a, it was not a new subdivision then, but there were still some vacant lots, so sure. we built our first house there. That's a, that's a very handy location. Mm -hmm. It was a good, good yeah. decision. And the schools, you're near the schools and right. things of that sort. Right. Down to yeah. Our two boys, John and Michael, they went to school at Cumberland for their primary education. Uh, well, talk so a little bit about when your initial appointment and you were the uh, focus on public policy and community development. Mm -hmm. 1968, came here and uh, in the public policy community development area. There were a couple of things. The, the job description itself fit what I was looking for, a major major extension appointment with some uh, time in research. Um, but probably the thing that attracted me particularly to Purdue was two individuals that were here at the time that became my mentors, if you will, Carol Bottom and Heavy J.B. J.B. Heavy Kohlmeyer. You uh, did some research. When, yeah, which one of your uh, first things that you did on that? Uh, the you led a public policy on property taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, at that time, they were national leaders in public policy education work, and uh, their their model followed uh, what they call a non-advocacy approach to public policy because they realized that uh, there are a lot of value judgments involved in making policy decisions. And they thought it was the citizens' responsibility to put the values into the decisions and their responsibility to provide information to help them make a decision. So they were very careful in all their education work, never to use words that uh, conveyed uh, a notion that they thought that there was something that they should, that there was a right answer to the program, to the policy. Yes, sir. Uh, That's a good so term, they not advocate. Not, they did not advocate solutions. They advocated ed educating populace. That then made public. They could have input to the public policy makers. And so you didn't use words like uh, better or worse or uh, some of the other words that a lot, a lot of times. In this should be. It should be yeah. Perhaps. Right or uh, advantages or disadvantages. They liked the word consequences. So uh, they, could, they could do an educational approach and talk about the consequences of various policy options, but then whether that consequence was good or bad was a decision that the populace needed to make and the policy makers needed to, to hear. To bear in mind. Right. Uh, Carol Bottom at the time, major focus was on uh, national uh, issues and national policies, and particularly agricultural policy. Uh, Kohlmeyer's focus was more on state issues, 
and it was more. It was a good combination then for you yeah, from both, of, right. both, both right. sides. At the time, uh, uh, both of them were uh, a few years from retirement. But the department was beginning to bring young faculty in to work with them as mentors. And uh, I ended up doing most of the state level issues working much closer with, uh, with uh, Colmar than I did with Carol. Uh, but the approach they always used, there was a, a group of, back then there must have been six or seven of us in the department working in the whole area, and one of us would take a leadership role on a particular policy issue, but everybody critiqued your lesson plan, and you had to pass muster there but among your peers before they'd let you go out in the field and talk about it, <laughs> which was a, uh, a very good uh, way to approach the Good approach. Yeah. Um, it seems like, uh, at least for the f last 50 years, the two issues that have always been important in Indiana, property taxes and funding local schools. Just as much the issue today as it was very. then. And does it get hotter or very hot or hotter? Uh, it's, it's just constant. Yeah. Um, I worked closely with Heavy for uh, uh, a couple of years, and with his help, we put together a statewide educational program uh, on financing local schools and property taxes. Um, one of my first solo events was up in Marshall County. Uh, Heavy and I had been around the state and done several of these uh, education programs together. He did most of it and I, I listened, participated some, and uh, came back to campus and he said, uh, got a call from a gentleman up in Marshall County. He wants, wants us to come up and talk about our program up there. And he said, uh, I can't go, so you'll have to take it. Well, I knew he could have gone if he wanted to, but he wanted me to do it. So he was throwing me out there <laughs> to see if I could sink or swim. The gentleman that had called him was Otis Bowen, who was a member of a small group in Marshall County called the Marshall County Community Development Committee. And back then, uh, Extension worked with community development committees in probably uh, 15 or so counties around the state. These local committees met on a pretty regular basis. Extension provided um, input into their discussions of whatever policy issues they were looking at. And Would so this be the local extension agent or the extension with um, uh, Purdue? The extension with Purdue. The, okay. the local extension agent was involved, but he he helped support the committee, but usually... And maybe get the people together and uh, program Depending on the issue, then you had an extension specialist to come in and, and provide a lot of the program. Uh, so I went up and made the presentation, had a good good evening. I thought it went reasonably well. <laughs> that must have been 1970. The following year, um, John Hicks called over, who was at that time was headed up to produce uh, state relations work. With the legislature. With the legislature. And he said they'd had a contact from down there, and uh, Otis Bowen, who at that time was Speaker of the House, needed some help in the Legislative Council because they had just lost some of their staff who had been working on school finance and wondered if Purdue would let me come down for three months to work with them during the legislative session. So that's how I ended up getting involved with initial, this contact. initial contact with the state. So I went to Purdue, encouraged me to do that. Went down and worked with the uh, legislative council, it was called at that time, Legislative Service Agency today. And it's a professional staff that staffs the, it's a nonpartisan or bipartisan, if you will, group that staffs the various committees of the legislature. Um, in addition, some of the committees have staff of their own, but this is a, a group that works under the leadership of the Legislative Council, which is the legislative leaders of both House and Senate. Ed Thuma at the time was the director of the Legislative Services Agency, and I worked closely with Ed and others 
for that year and then the following year as well. Uh, the governor, the Governor Bowen was l running for the governorship at that that time and was running on a property tax relief platform. Uh, was elected. Uh, Ed Thuma became the budget director then for him in his first term. And I continued to work some with Ed as budget director in uh, short term research program projects for him. Um, after the governor's first term, Ed decided four years as budget director was as long as, as much as he could stand. <laughs> so he talked to the governor, and uh, the governor apparently picked the phone up and called John Hicks. And uh, then Ed Thuma called me and said the governor wants to talk to you. Well, the governor calls and says he wants to talk to you, you go see the governor. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on at the time. Uh, so I went down and he offered me the job as a budget director. Well, that was, as far as I was concerned, completely out of, the, out of the blue. I had no idea that that was a possibility. It scared me to death, really, <laughs> to think about it. Uh, I would think so. So I came back trying to find somebody that would tell me I shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Whom should I ask? Whom should I talk to, right? I couldn't find anybody here that wouldn't didn't encourage me to to take the job and to go down for what I assumed would be a four year stint during Doc Bowen's second term. Went down and uh, had an interesting four years. Did you walk, did you live down there or did you commute? I uh, tried commuting for a few months and that just didn't work for me. Because uh, you could so eat the we, hours and yeah, just there, there was just no way. Um, Kids didn't want to move, of course, but it turns out I think it was probably good, good for them too, as it turns out. Yeah, that would have been. I started my budget director in 1976. Yeah, that's what I have in the new one. And uh, we must have moved to Zionsville in the spring of '77. And then we continued to live there until I came back to Purdue, which was 1985, and we'll fill in a gap here to me. Um, That's grown a lot in Zionsville, hasn't it? Yeah, I remember, yeah. I, well, we both came the same year, and I remember going down and it. I, I was a, it was just a small uh, right, suburb and, at that time. And I remember, too, there was a, um, in the, in a Mercedes Benz. No, it was, it was a Rolls Royce dealership. You were a Rolls Royce, and I, I, thought, I was really taken back. You know, I went down there to investigate it, and I had lunch, right. you know, and looked at the shops and everything, and I thought, I said, wow, I was really blown away the, by it. I didn't expect to see it in this small was, complex at that time. There was probably one Rolls Royce in the county, <laughs> right. I don't know. But, <laughs> right. But they had they brought Rolls Royces from Chicago really, and all over the Midwest coming yeah, in there I, to get their, get their service done. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> then after that, uh, then you moved to the yeah, state board. Yeah, after four years, and that was uh, and Bowen's Doc, term Doc's second, second term, and he couldn't uh, succeed himself. Uh, during that eight years, uh, uh, Governor Orr was the uh, lieutenant, lieutenant governor, governor. Mm -hmm. and uh, of course, in my position, I got to know him reasonably well, too. And uh, I just assumed after four years as budget director, I'd come back to Purdue. By the way, because the budget office had some input into Purdue's budget, I resigned completely from Purdue at that time. I, rather than being on leave, I just didn't think it was the right thing to do. Um, it after, made it clearer. Yeah. Right. Uh, after that, um, after Orr was elected, 
Excuse me, let me know, or did he have in charge of agriculture, life, uh, or commerce? I know they've made some changes, and I'm a little hazy yeah, on what yeah. the He's responsibility uh, agriculture of the lieutenant was, at that time. was part of. Okay. Yeah. Because it was uh, Daniels has changed all of that, isn't it? The egg and, and Vicky and, and that, that whole thing has changed a little bit. I'm, I'm sure it has. Yeah. And uh, the lieutenant governor was also the commissioner of agriculture back then. Right. Uh, it was not, they, they had a very small staff and was not nearly as involved in agriculture as is true in many other states. Okay. All the regulatory functions that have always been part of Purdue in most states are done by the Department of Agriculture. That's good for but, researchers to know, that's good point. Uh, <laughs> so he called me right after the elections and said I'd like you to stay as budget director. And I said, Governor, I, I've been here four and a half years I don't want to stay as budget director. I'm ready to go back to Purdue. He said, well, I really want you to be part of my administration. What do you, what job do you want? <laughs> well, that's an offer I could handle, maybe. <laughs> well, I had been... Yeah, I'd a had, proof of life. <laughs> I had had four years' experience with state finances, so I felt like I had a pretty good notion of what they were all about. And uh, I'd all had, always had an interest in locals local finances, local school finances. And the state had, at that time, an organization called the State Board of Tax Commissioners. It was a three-member board, uh, all appointed by the governor. Uh, they had a, a chairman and two vice chairmen. The two vice chairmen had to be of opposite parties, so you had a bipartisan group. Um, and uh, their main responsibility was to oversee local budgets uh, throughout the throughout state, the the state and uh, also the property tax assessment process. And so I said, well, I, I, my only choice was that or revenue department. And I had, had quite a bit of background in the state, so I set it up. Um, it, was, it was a position the, the then chairman was retiring. And so I uh, went over there and became chairman of the State Board of Tax Commissioners for um, two years. At that point, the governor was beginning to think about re-election after two years and uh, wanted me to come and work with him in his office as director of policy analysis. And uh, so I moved over to the governor's office for, for two years stayed there. Probably the, uh, the thing that most people would remember uh, about those two years it was a time when we were struggling with the, what was to become the first nuclear power plant in the state. Marble Hill Power Plant was being built by Public Service Indiana. In a power plant? No, no, it wasn't a public, it was just public right. service in Indiana. Oh, okay. And that's how I served in Marion County. In that's right. Right area. But, that's right. Uh, the power plant served most of the rest of the state, except for a little bit up in the northwest and a little bit up in the northeast. Uh, they had okay. had this power plant under construction for uh, several years. And it got to the point where they could no longer finance the continuation of construction without getting some legislation that would allow them to put the investment they had in the power plant into calculating what their rates they could charge for electricity would be. And uh, there was state statute that disallowed that until their investment was actually generating electricity. And so so they came to the governor and wanted to get the governor's support to get legislation changed. Well, after con conversations with legislative leadership, there was no way that was going to happen. So he knew without that, a power co was likely to go into bankruptcy. And he didn't want that to happen. Um, so what could he do? Uh, he ended up appointing a citizens group of uh, 
leading business people from around the state. And you'll recall about that time, Chrysler had gone through an almost bankruptcy at the national level. And uh, they'd had some financial leadership that helped the federal government keep them out of bankruptcy. So one of the gentlemen on this committee was the vice chair of chancellor of uh, Chrysler, who agreed to serve on the committee to help us evaluate how we could go about putting together a financial package that would make sense. The committee got together, and there was about three of us in the governor's office that served in a uh, somewhat of a staff role. They decided to hire some consulting firms to help them figure this whole thing out. Bottom line was, after they got together and started looking at things, they said, well, first we need to evaluate how much demand there really is for electricity in the state and whether or not the investment will pay off. Uh, they had some independent company come in and help them do that evaluation. At the same time, another group was working on alternative financing options. Well, the first group concluded that not only was electricity not needed, uh, even the marginal cost of completing the plant couldn't be justified. And so we never got around to the second issue of the financial package. And so, as a result, uh, no legislation in public service in Indiana basically over the next few years ended up getting bought out by, uh, what was the company's name, Cincinnati Gas and Electric. Then eventually Duke Power Company bought, bought them out, so we're now part of the Duke system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. And I'll never forget the first few days after the announcement was made by the committee that uh, they couldn't recommend completion of the power plant. A lot of elderly people in this state that had a lot of their retirement money invested in utility stock because I always felt like it was a you know, conservative mm -hmm. investment, uh, pretty secure, and all of a sudden stock went $35 to down to three and a half dollars a share. And it was devastating for a lot of people. So it was a, I it was a, it was a tough decision. Tough, tough decision. And the government took a lot of flack for it as a result. And not many people really realized that his, that was not his intent when we went into this. He was looking for a way to help public service in Indiana complete the plan. Things occur. Sometimes it's good to know you have to know the right thing, and it's not yeah. not easy. Right. <clears throat> so then, after that, is that when you came? Yeah, that was time? in. Uh, that must have occurred in about 83, 84, yeah. somewhere along there. Right. I don't remember exactly. Because it's executive assistant of uh, 1983 under mm -hmm. four, and then 85 is when you came back. Did how did that come out? Did Dr. Baring touch base with you? Or? Uh, Dr. Baring must have been. Uh, hired as president in 84, 83, 84, right. Yeah. right after he was um, became the president. Had you met him before? I, I had met him at some committee meetings mm -hmm. where at that time he was the dean of medical school at Purdue at uh, IU. Uh, so he, he knew of me and we had more or less acquaintances oh, that really, right. really didn't know each other that well. Um, I had had some conversations with John Hicks, who of course was instrumental in hiring here, and uh, soon afterwards, after he was hired, he called me one day and said, I'd like to have lunch with you down at I campus at IUPUI one day, so I had lunch with him. He said, John, I just wanted to assure you that whenever you're ready and the governor is ready, there's a place for you back at Purdue. Who is this John Hicks said this? No, this is uh, Dr. 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 Berry. Okay. Um, John was getting up close to retirement at that point, and, and so they uh, they didn't really offer me the job then, but he just, Gary Berry just wanted me to know that 
he'd like to have me back at Purdue when I was ready to come back, which was comforting. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. By the way, I had, when Orr asked me to go back and stay for another four years, I had asked Purdue to put me back on uh, here uh, officially uh, so that uh, I had that connection back here at Purdue so I could come back in some capacity. Typically, the way that worked, and I think it probably worked that way at that time, was if a Purdue person was working for the state government, uh, it was under a contractual arrangement, and the state basically paid Purdue then for the, for the person's time, including retirement benefits and so forth. Although I stayed on state retirement, so I must I must have been still a state employee then. Um, In 95, 85, uh, toward the end of Orr's second term, uh, I decided it was, it was time to come back. Actually, John Hicks made the, made the contact with Orr and, and said, Purdue's ready for me to come back. And uh, so John contacted me and said, the president would like to talk to you. So I came up and talked to him. And, he uh, wanted me then to come and work with John as an assistant for a couple of years until John retired, and they wanted me to become director of state relations, which I then did in 1985. Tell us a little about and that position, that, that, now that you moved into there, fellow researchers. For Was it similar to what, or that John had been doing? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, although John, at that time in his career, I think he was actually called a senior vice president. So in addition to state relations, he had some other responsibilities, uh, which I, would, I, I became a director of state relations at that, at that point in my career here, um, with the understanding that when John did retire that I would be the director of state relations. Uh, John retired, must have been 87, 88, somewhere along there. And he retired, and then I took over as director of the program, and didn't get the vice president's title until a couple of years later. <laughs> I don't saw remember. That. Right, yeah. Was it what, 1990, maybe, something or something like that? One thing, though, that you that was not on your resume when it, you were also the equal opportunity um, um, uh, executive. There was a memorandum that I, that uh -huh, I came across right, too. Right, right. Yeah. I had forgotten all about that. <laughs> equal you opportunity. That you, yeah, right. You're right, the chair, officer, and then chair of the, that. That's right, and yeah. the memora executive memorandum was in 86. Okay. It came out, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's when we, I think, maybe hired the first uh, full-time director of that office. Yeah, probably was. Uh, that was the result of federal legislation and so yeah. forth. Which right, that could very well be. Yeah. Uh, then you were also, at one time, the Indiana Higher Education Telecommunications System chair, yeah. and then vice chair of the that, that citizens committee that O'Bannon set up too at one time. That was a tax tax committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The uh, IHATS, Indiana Higher Education Telecommunication, had been one of the things that John had also Hicks had also worked with as Purdue's representative on that committee. And when he retired, I took over that to position too. Yeah. Uh, as the um, vice president for state relations, did you they interact with? The, I'm thinking the, the, the research interacted with the legislature. Is that? Yeah. Um, the, the state relations office has a lot to do with with helping to put together the budget and budget requests for every four years, and you work a lot with with legislative committees on that. But the first step is working with the higher education commission. And, uh, we had a lot of, I, had, I spent a lot of my time actually working with the commission, not only on budget, but on any higher education issues in the state as, as Purdue's representative. Uh, different presidents do it differently, but Dr. Beering uh, thought it was higher education commission was important enough. He went personally to nearly all of the commission meetings. I doubt he, he rarely missed the meeting. But I worked with the staff behind the scenes 
prior to most of the meetings, and if there's issues coming up, greet the president on, on the issues. And we had an internal discussion then with the appropriate people here at the university, depending on what the issue was. Uh, so you worked in Lewis on the kind of right, right. right. And all of those universities had similar people, and so we we tried to work as as much as possible, work together on even on budget issues, because we always felt here that uh, to the extent that we could work together, we'd raise the water for everybody rather than fighting each other over, over issues. And you're not going to come out ahead doing that. So we we really worked pretty well together. That's on, nice. On it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not an it's, easy thing. It's easier for us and it's easier for the legislature and the governor to make decisions when the universities aren't squabbling with each other. <laughs> I got you. I hear you. Right. Oh. So. <laughs> then I, I you reached a point, were there anything, any special things that during that time before you came back to AgiCon that you want to comment on? Um, Is that the time the but, or economy but, was not too bad. During, during the years that I was budget director, the economy was very good. Yeah. Very high inflation was the problem then. And of course, inflation just generates tax dollars. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't have any budget, really serious budget problems during the years I was budget director. But then the 81 recession hit. And uh, during uh, Orr's two terms, he raised taxes twice. Uh, once, and uh, we had a special session in, in December of, must have been 82 prior to the 83 session. We had about a three-day special session in December and passed a tax increase. <laughs> <laughs> Could you recall these things? I think back and I go, oh, well, <laughs> I'm sure it happened. <laughs> uh, at that time, Republicans had control of both houses, so it was possible to do it. But it was hard to get them convinced that that's what they should do. Yeah, I would imagine. But we finally convinced them that we had to have revenue coming in quickly. And the only way to do that is to get the sales tax increased and let the money start flowing. And we knew that if it got in, if that become a part of the mix in a normal legislative session, all kinds of things would get tacked to it, and we wouldn't be able to get anything through until the end of the session. And so we finally convinced them this is the way. This is the way to go. And I'm sure it's never been done that way before, <laughs> or since. Or since, right? Certainly not in today's time. So. so uh, where are we? Uh, did you, is that you want to move on when you came back to Aggie? You decided that. Yeah, well, a couple of comments about my work in state relations. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I very much appreciated, uh, and from my perspective, is, is critical that a person in this role needs to have a direct connection to the president. Going through anybody else weakens his position with the legislature and the leadership down there. When I met with legislators or with the governor's office, the Wire Education Commission staff, they knew I was speaking for the president. One voice. One voice. Uh, so I, that was something I very much appreciated. And back then, I think that tended to be true of all the institutions in Indiana. Uh, there were counterparts to yours at the other ones as yes, well? Yes, okay. yes. Now, uh, Indiana and uh, Purdue universities are, well, are a little different than many other state, large state institutions in that quite often the other institutions had a vice president for government relations, which is what Purdue has now. And then they had a state relations person and a federal relations person underneath the government relations office. Uh, we didn't do that at that time here at Purdue. Uh, the person in charge of government of federal relations was 
always been the vice president for research because most of the federal dollars that come into the institution okay. are research dollars. Coming from the federal government. Coming from the federal government. Mm -hmm. So worked fine then. I'm sure it can work sure. well other ways too, but that's just the way Purdue had it organized. Right. And during that time, Bob Greenhorn was uh, the vice president for research and did the federal uh, relations okay. contacts. And a lot of the work was not with elected officials, but it was with the agencies that got the money that ended up right. coming to Purdue. Right. When you came back to Purdue, then you uh, relocated back here? Yeah, moved back here. State, or do you want to talk a little bit about Aggie kind of a couple of things that um, you did there, but establishing that uh, you established that first full time position in the Purdue Extension leadership and also the uh, community learning centers? Yeah, that, that was the two things that I, I, I guess probably had the biggest impact on, on the institution and, and the state when I was involved in that. Um, when I went back to Aggie Con, there had been a couple of national committees looking at extension. And extension is always, most states have always uh, uh, been in the process of evaluating how, they, how they're doing and what they're doing and so forth. Um, there was a national committee that had formed that President Jiski actually chaired that started talking about engagement rather than outreach or extension. And uh, so when I, when I went back to Ag Econ and began to have some conversations with folks over there, um, there were a couple of counties that began to seriously look at expanding Extension's role in their communities. Uh, and about the same time, Lily and Dama had uh, offered some fairly sizable grants. In this area? Uh, in adult education basically in education actually not just adult education but in education areas and uh, several of the counties actually applied to uh, through the extension service to do some do some work and Tipton County was one that got funding through Lily but prior to that I had been working with Clinton County Hendricks, Hamil Hamil Hamilton County, no, Hendricks County, uh, Marshall County, a little bit with Whitley County, and then some with uh, two counties north of here, and, uh, Noble County, and what's, what's just west of Noble, uh, LaGrange. Uh, no, the range is up yeah. the other way. Anyway, I've been working with several counties. And this idea of learning centers evolved. Clinton County uh, was probably the, the most active, and today probably still one of the most active programs. And most of us felt that these, this expanded role, while Purdue had a role to play in, in the extension office uh, in most counties, is uh, has a credibility. The Purdue connection is important to them. And so uh, we, we built a model around these centers becoming a county entity, not a Purdue entity, but with a Purdue connection where the local community felt that was important. Um, and began offering a wide range of programming not just in agriculture, home economics, and 4-H. Uh, Locally, on site there. Yes. Uh, this is partly where I had scheme in, the higher education telecommunication system, because increasingly institutions were offering programs through distance learning. And so if you had two or three students who wanted to take a particular course, even if Purdue didn't offer it, there's a good chance one of the other institutions was offering it, and so the extension office became a mechanism for people to find out what was available and, 
through IHATS, we were able to get the equipment sure. in all of the extension offices, so they became part of the IHATS network and uh, facilitated that whole process. And I, think, I still think it's a, it's a model that has some potential mm -hmm. for the future of extension. Back back then, Ivy Tech was uh, was offering a lot of programming, uh, but not nearly to the extent that they are today. And I, I still think there's a role for both to play. With the size of the population and, and the demand, right. and the people that many of them that are older want to come come back, or they need it, 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 positions have changed in right. duties and skills, or whatever. One of the most innovative programs that Clinton County has developed, and this occurred after I left there, but they now have a, an agreement with Monterey uh, University in Mexico where they're offering a uh, program for the Hispanics in the community to finish up a high school degree from Monterey through Monterey College, and they get an equivalent of a GED degree yeah, there at the extension. That is innovative. That's great. With the extension sure. office in, in Clinton County. Which Very is, good. Which right is, on. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Sort of thinking outside the box. There you go. Which is good. We need more of that. <laughs> yeah. The other area that uh, you mentioned was uh, Extension's decision to to create a uh, a new position in the Central Extension Office here on campus. Here on campus. Okay. Um, the community development, uh, economic development. Uh, rural development area uh, had always been located within the Ag Econ Department. And I had felt that in order for it to, and within the department, it sort of competed with, for resources with other farm management, marketing, agribusiness, international programs, and so forth. And until we could get a base that was larger than the Ag Econ Department uh, for, for funding a leadership position, uh, it was going to be uh, continue to have difficulty getting the resources that it needed to be effective in the state. And so I began to work with the dean and the, and the uh, extension director. It would be, was that parents? David? Uh, they, uh, they Petrich's. Petrich's, yeah, right. Uh -huh. And uh, Vic Lecklebo. And they finally agreed to create a, an additional uh, assistant director of extension for community development. Before the person, they'd always had one for agriculture and always had one for consumer and family sciences and always had one for 4-H, but they didn't have one for community development. The community development position always been staffed with the Ag Econ budget, so we were able to get moved over to the days. And now out of that, Sam Cordes was, was hired and he now has a center for regional, uh, center for regional development, I think is what it's called. Something it. like that. Rings a bell, so I haven't yeah. read something uh, about it. Yeah. In addition to being the uh, head of the uh, community development work, and he has a, a staff under him now that works in that area. So it, it's worked out. I think more effort, more resources going into it than would have otherwise. And it's doing, very, doing pretty well. Yeah, I think That's so. That's nice. I think so. That's very good. Uh, after, uh, let's switch gears just a little bit. Talk about the Africa University in Zimbabwe. Okay. And uh, I actually retired in in '03. Did you did you uh, did you get on halftime? Did you decide to go on halftime? I went on early partial retirement. Oh, okay. Uh, must have been three years prior to that. Oh, 2000. About 2000, I suppose. I must have gone back to Ag Econ about 98. It's about 99, 99. returns. Okay. I had it could be 99, no. 98. Okay. Um, Africa University, I don't remember. We've had an earlier conversation, but I don't Off think it was, on, it was no, okay. not on tape, was it? 
Africa University is a uh, Methodist related university located in, in Zimbabwe which as I indicated earlier is where I grew up. It turns out the university is actually on the mission station where I was born. In 1993, the vice chancellor of Africa University under their system would be equivalent to our president because their chancellor of their university is chairman of the board. So the vice chancellor is equivalent to our president. He's here on campus speaking to the North Indiana Conference of the United Methodist Church. And uh, I learned that he was going to be here through reading an article in the Exponent and realized that the university was being built where I was born. What an eye opener. <laughs> yeah. So I invited uh, John Wesley Kurewa and his wife out to our home uh, for dinner and we had a nice conversation, got to know each other and he learned about my background. He asked me if uh, I, uh, had ever been back to Zimbabwe, and I said, no, not since I left there in 1950. And uh, he said, would you like to? I said, sure. He said, well, there's a group from Indiana going next year. So in 1994, I joined, my wife and I joined a group, and I went back home for the first time in 50 years, 44 years, actually. And uh, since then, I've been back uh, three more times, so I've been back four times now. And I'm continuing to work with them on various projects. In 1995, I guess it was, the dean of the School of Agriculture and uh, his assistant uh, came to Purdue. And we had a number of meetings with uh, people here at the university, including Dr. Beering at that time. And out of those meetings, uh, we develop a memorandum of understanding between the institutions. It doesn't commit either one to anything except saying that uh, if the need arises and it's beneficial to both institutions, we agree to work together. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> Which is open-ended and doesn't commit anybody, but is a recognition that the circumstances might arise and would be helpful to that both institutions. That would benefit both sides. Yeah. That's very good. Uh, not too much has developed out of that at this point, but uh, we continue to work with them. Have any of their students thought of coming to Purdue? Or? There have been some graduates from the university who got one that uh, our church actually helped get through the university there. Uh, she applied here to Ag Econ Department and ended up with a master's degree in Ag Econ and a PhD in Consumer Family Science and is uh, now a Assistant, pre uh, assistant professor at Virginia Polytechnic Institute, BPI. Mm -hmm. Virginia Tech, they call it. I sure, guess. that's right. Oh, very nice. And, well, that's uh, good. There have been um, a couple of other students who, one is a former faculty member uh, there who came finishing up his doing some graduate work here. So there have been some, uh, some student that's programs. Really uh, my wife and I created a, a small endowment to provide some financial assistance for any student here who's interested in working on agricultural and uh, nutritional work in Africa. Not tied to the university, but it, it, it doesn't produce much revenue yet, but maybe someday it will. Oh, it sounds <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, I had, uh, let's talk a little about your family. Did your children go end up coming to Purdue? Did your sons graduate? Both uh, sons have high school degrees from Zionsville. Both ended up at Purdue, both in engineering. Oldest one's John. Um, he got a bachelor's in aeronautical engineering, went through a co-op program with McDonnell Douglas, uh, worked for McDonnell Douglas for several years. Uh, and now he's working with Ford Motor Company. <laughs> and, uh, has had some challenges the last few years, but Ford's doing quite well, actually. Uh, Michael, the younger one, uh, got an undergraduate. Well, John ended up also doing a master's degree from University of Missouri while he was working with McDonald Douglas. Michael did an undergraduate in mechanical engineering and then got an MSIA program in school management. 
and he's been with Coral Creek Corporation. Where is he? In Michigan? In Michigan. Oh, okay. St. Joe, Michigan. Okay. Corporate headquarters. Okay. He's had a number of leadership positions there. He's currently, I think his uh, title is Director of Marketing for KitchenAid Division. That's pretty good. He's, they're both doing quite well. And they're not too far away either, right. which is nice. Right. <laughs> um, let's talk about return. What are your activities? I know for the researchers, he's on his way to Florida. <laughs> Two things. I've continued to work with Ashford University. I just got back from the trip over there. And the other How one long is, do you usually stay when you go there? Uh, to the university, oh. just usually about two weeks. Okay. It's short term. I've, uh, last two trips I've taken over in 05 when I went, actually went specifically to take my oldest son and his family. They had not? Had not been there before. Oh. So that was a real... Yeah, that was, that was nice to get, special. to get them to see their roots. <laughs> that's right. Where great grandpa was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm planning to take the younger family probably in another couple of years. Then in the meantime, I got acquainted with an organization in Florida called ECHO, Educational Concerns for Hunger Organization. Uh, it's an organization that got started in the early 1980s dealing with uh, agricultural and nutrition problems in the tropical areas of the world, South America, Africa, Asia. They have a network now of uh, something over 3,000 development workers who are working in these countries about 180 different countries represented. And they're, they're simply a network and a resource for people who are in those countries working. Uh, they have educational programs in Fort Myers. Um, people write in and they have a particular problem. If they don't know the answer there, they'll put the problem on the web and somebody in the world has, has solved that problem and they'll share information. They have a seed bank of about 350 specialized seeds that they have identified around the world that may be common in some parts of the world, but other parts of the world don't have any idea. Where are their headquarters? In North Fort Myers, oh, Florida. Oh, so that's where the headquarters where that's, you are. Mm, okay. That's where, the, where you go. Their, their headquarters, and that's where I volunteered. In our last trip to Africa University, I took the founding director of ECHO with me, and we spent most of our time working with the faculty there on the idea of how the university might expand their outreach programs extension programs, if you will, to small-scale farmers in Zimbabwe, but also begin to develop training programs for development workers throughout Africa. And we're hoping that will materialize, and if it makes sense to have a connection with ECHO, then so be it. Okay. At least you're making the start with yeah. this, which uh, is good. ECHO has decided they're going to start uh, identifying some satellite locations. They started one up on a trial basis in Thailand last year, and they're looking for a location or one or more locations in Africa. And whether or not Africa University will be one of them, I don't know yet. But Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> see what happens. Yeah. Uh, so. How about, uh, do you have a, a Purdue tradition or an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to, and then I'll let you make the closing comments. Uh, Good luck. An outstanding event in your life? The event? Uh -huh. You can have more than one. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to hard to identify anything particular. Um, okay. Oftentimes it's yeah. when you get met with your wife and things yeah. of that sort of thing. Uh, and that's really nice. I, I, don't, I, I don't see anything okay. along How about a lines. Purdue tradition? Yeah. One come to mind? Sports or you used to go to football and things when you Oh, were I, I went to a lot of sports events. Part of the thing that we did in state relations, of course, was to, <laughs> to uh, host legislators <laughs> at all kinds of events. I got kind of burned out on it, frankly. <laughs> I did my bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I still enjoy watching watching the games, but, yeah. uh, but uh, I don't buy tickets because basketball, I'm in Florida during most of the sure, season. Right. And any time I decide I want to go to a game, I can usually find somebody that will sell me a ticket or I can get a we ticket somewhere, them. so I don't right. I don't buy a lot, yeah. of, a lot of tickets. But I still enjoy the sports and watch them and listen to them if they're not That's on right. TV. Okay. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Is there anything I forgot to ask that you'd like to share? It certainly is 
uh, tough time, different times right now. Yeah. It's yeah. 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 Uh, We've had the budget situation right now is probably the worst since 1981. I remember a year down there when uh, I was, it must have been 83, I was in the governor's office, I was not budget director at the time, but uh, we delayed a lot of payments uh, toward the end of the fiscal year just in order to have a, Something a, a balance. And I remember the budget director telling me when she closed the books at the end of one year, she had like $280,000 left in the bank <laughs> on a multi-million dollar budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, these, so these happen to all of us. They, they, uh, there have been a lot of those, yeah. but this is, I think, by far the, the worst situation. Complicating the situation right now is the fact that the state has basically taken over the entire cost of local education schools, operating budget at the state level and taking it off the property tax. Contrary to my upbringing, I always thought that property taxes should continue to be a part of the budget because it was a stable source of revenue for local schools. And it's not a politically popular position to take, but <laughs> I think they're beginning to discover maybe they wish they <laughs> had a little bit. <laughs> the possibility, right? <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> anything, any, anything else that you can think of? Sure I, I'm sure I get home oh. and think of a lot of things oh. I should have talked about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't think so. I want to thank you, Dr. Percy. This has been very nice. I really appreciate yeah. that. Very much. <laughs>